Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Shea. Welcome to Habitat Now. We are honored uh, to have legendary artist Paul Stankard uh, join us today. Uh, Paul's been in the Habitat family, he told me, for 47 years, which is pretty amazing, being the gallery just had our 48th class internationally. So it's a hell of a legacy, pardon my French, and we're honored to have Paul today. Um, Paul, I want you to say hello and, uh, and join us in a second. And I just want to say, if you're on YouTube and you're following this, feel free to like, subscribe, and hit that bell. We do these videos usually once a week and uh, sharing the world that we love. Paul, say hi. Hello, I'm very proud and happy to be here. I remember when your mom and uh, uh, Ferd were uh, just little people. <laughs> Starting out. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, uh, where do I begin? You know, I, I've had a, a beautiful career. It's been, uh, it's, I've educated myself to the things I care about. My work as a, you know, my career has been a learning experience and still is. I graduated from Salem County Community College in 1963 and, uh, worked in industry for about, uh, Ten nine years, left industry to, to make uh, uh, paperweights, floral paperweights, and uh, maybe you were, maybe we could sh uh, show some slides. Yep, I'll kick into that right now. Let me uh, start the business end of this, and I'll take everybody's screen. And I again thank Paul for being here today, and I'll uh, start off with a little bit of business. Um, upcoming at the end of this month, we are doing our very first glass art fair. It is an online exhibition celebrating the artists in the Habitat family that we know and love. You'll be getting information about it soon and opportunity to see the work and it will be up for all of November with a special VIP preview for uh, members of AACG. Um, and it's gonna be an amazing presentation from the safety of your own home. Uh, and it will be up the same time as uh, Expo Ch in Intersect Chicago, which is the new name for SOFA. Um, Here's a little preview of it. You'll be getting this postcard in the mail. Just a new endeavor here at Habitat. Um, some amazing works by amazing people. Expect um, to see some beautiful things. So without further ado, a warm welcome to legendary uh, artist Paul Stenker from the Habitat family. And I consider everybody who's watching part of our family. So here we go. Paul, your very first slide. Okay, this is, uh, I was trained in uh, scientific glass blowing. As I said, I graduated in 63 from Salem Community College and worked in industry. And this is uh, building a uh, distillation head for uh, organic chemistry. Next. And then I left, I left the, uh, I left uh, <clears throat> the uh, pharmaceutical company to work in the electron optical world and these are actually, when I look back over my ex industrial experience, the electron optical world offered, it was a wonderful advantage for um, detail and precision and interpreting uh, small scale things. And these are two examples of uh, glass to metal seals. Next. So here I am in Southern New Jersey. I'm going to move from Massachusetts to um, Southern New Jersey in 1959. And Southern New Jersey has a rich glass tradition. And the crown jewel of that glass tradition was the Millville Rose. Paperweights were very uh, collected, uh, very sought after and collected uh, um, area of the uh, for glass makers and uh, the Millville Rose was a wonderful challenge to me because I grew up in the rural Massachusetts, loved nature and the idea that you could put a flower in a ball of glass was pretty exciting to me. Next. <clears throat> so in 1969 I started experimenting with paperweights and I had made a uh, Prior to that, I had a young family and a growing family. Pat and I, my wife and I have five children. But at the time, uh, 
we had uh, three children and I was earning, I wanted to earn extra money and I was making giftware. And then the giftware became pretty monotonous and I decided I was gonna to try to make paperweights. So I, uh, for about a year, focused on animals. And that was, uh, it wasn't until I changed focus and started playing with flowers that I found my, I found a, 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 I found my niche. Next. So this is uh, an early, this is 1971 uh, paperweight where I have, um, I enjoyed focusing on native flowers with the roots and the buds and detail and, and that was an exciting, uh, exciting for me because I, I'm so proud of the work and every day I could change, put a couple more flowers on it or add an instant, you know, I mean, I was constantly learning how to uh, uh, present more botanical information in the work. Next. So I'm going to fast forward 27 years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it's funny because when I first started, I think I didn't have to pay taxes for about six years when I was self-employed. And then I can remember telling Pat, hey, Pat, hey, we made enough money to pay taxes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Times change. That <It> changed. <laughs> so, so in 19... Uh, so I worked in a, in a small studio for 27 years, and then uh, Pat and I had bought the house next door. The zoning board gave me a variance to uh, produce, to have a, uh, to work at home and have a studio. And this is, uh, this was completed in uh, 1997. Next. And so the floor space from moving from 600, 600 square feet to 3,000 square feet, lo and behold, my work changed. Everything started to, I had the, so much more freedom. I had, op I had space to hire some uh, people, my family, my daughters worked for me, and uh, I have had a beautiful assistant, Dave Graver, who has been with me for 30 years or better. So it really, um, the new space was, it, it continues to be a joy uh, to work in. Next. I'll add that uh, Paul gave a uh, full tour of his space on the Glass 48 website. It was sent to you via email too before this talk. It's a great presentation as he walks around and talks about his daily life. And in the 80s, uh, I actually hit an invisible wall. I hit this glass wall that I didn't feel I was going through the motions. I didn't feel that my work was evolving as much as I wanted it to. And I thought, well, let me try something a little different. So I started writing poetry. And that was fun. Actually, um, when I was in uh, middle school, I was a very poor reader and a poor student, consequently. So my mother would tutor me and it was, it was, it was, oh, it was horrible. Sitting there stumbling over words. So she did something which was so uh, successful from my perspective. She started buying books, poetry books, children's poetry books. And she would read the poem. <laughs> and then because of my memory skills, I would, recite the poem. I could read the poem. It was half memory and half figuring it out. And I felt so proud. So um, I think that that uh, reading poetry as a way of learning how to read stayed with me and uh, responsible for my writing poetry. And about six months into writing poetry, I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a poet, I should know the great poets and start reading the great poets. And I uh, quickly learned that Walt Whitman, which is 10 miles north of Mantua, New Jersey, was, um, is considered America's, one of America's greatest literary geniuses. So I wrote a, I read it, a bio, I listened to, I don't want to get ahead of myself. 
But I listened to books on tape. And in 1972, I started, I discovered audible books. And I developed, a, I developed a great joy reading books, <laughs> listening to them, I call them reading them. So I read uh, Whitman's uh, biography by uh, Justin Kaplan. It was a definitive story on Whitman. Started reading his poetry and that influenced my work. And it's been really been a beautiful, uh, beautiful influence. Next. And here's, uh, oh, here's, this is a, a swarm, honeybee swarm, with flowers, fruit, honey, cool, honey uh, cones. And one of the things that really complemented my bees, I was, I was trying to make bees, figure in and out, and I read in Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, his, his uh, masterwork, his master poem, masterwork. Walt said in one of his lines, the wild, let's see, you have to rely on my old man's memory. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, well, let's see, the wild bee, no, oh, the wild hairy bee hankers and murmurs up and down. And I thought, the wild, hairy bee. So this is in the summertime, so I went on there, and I didn't know bees were hairy. So I went outside and got a little, a little jaw jaw, caught a bee, looked at it, God, look how hairy it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to, that was uh, the beginning of putting fuzz on my honeybees. And it was been a wonderful success for me. Okay. And from the fuzzy honeybees, can, can you go back to the food? Sure. From the fuzzy honeybees, I made, I learned how to do prickly fruit and uh, flowers and next. So this is an example of the, uh, uh, one of the masterworks in the antique French paperweight experience, a salamander crafted by Pantan paperweights in the mid 1800s. And when I started to uh, uh, I started somehow I developed the idea you can go next somehow I developed the idea that if you want to do excellent work you have to know what excellence is. So listening to the books on tape I focused on literature classical literature interested in I read most of the American the Western canon, and also um, art history. And I started to uh, take a serious look at what had been done in the uh, antique French paperweight tradition and also the history of glass. This is an example of uh, flame worked glass, uh, Marie Antoinette, the diorama, it's at Corning, it's a masterwork. And it's about 10 inches wide, eight inches deep, probably 12 inches high. And uh, it's really remarkable. Next, a little beggar. You know, I think interestingly enough, I'm friendly with Lina, <laughs> Lucio Babaco. Lucio's a real, he's very talented with his figures. And I think that Lucio's work is equal to the historic best in this field. So it's kind of fun. Next, this is the beggar. So here I am. Uh, my focus had been native flowers. First, first 10 or 15 years, I was trying to get them very botanically accurate. And then slowly, they, with the, with the uh, interest in poetry and literature, and slowly I started to enjoy uh, referencing native flowers. My work became referential. And um, in Song of Myself, Whitman wrote, the, um, the morning glory by my window satisfies me more than the metaphysics of books. <laughs> now, whoa, that's powerful. That's the depth of feeling that that suggests. It's fascinating. So 
This is some of the next. And so Whitman had really captured my attention and really touched my heart and soul with his words, the depth that he brings to the, to the work. And then I was in New York uh, and I saw a retrospective by Morris Graves, a, uh, a West Coast, a North, Northwestern, uh, I think he's from Seattle, Portland area. Uh, he did floral paintings, among other things, birds and flowers. And his work really, really, uh, I thought was unbelievable. And so Morris Grace has been a great influence in my, in my career. Next. So, so that's the reference. Whitman, Morris Grace, literature, poetry. Um, and now I'm in process. So I was uh, fascinated. I feel so fortunate to have been, how do I say this? Uh, being invited to exhibit, this is interesting. This is really beautiful from my perspective. Uh, Ferd Hampson, the Habitat Gallery was, was gonna have a, uh, wanted to have a, a exhibition on paperweights. A lot of the, uh, the studio artists were doing paperweights. Littleton, Zaposky, Kuhn, a lot of them. And so um, that was the conferred new field, the contemporary paperweight field. And he invited Ken Wilson, who was a curator or director of the Henry Ford Museum, who worked at Corning to recommend contemporary paperweight makers who were working in a traditional vein. So I got an invitation to, to exhibit at uh, Habitat Gallery five pieces. And uh, I didn't know the Habitat Gallery from, you know, I, I didn't know much about it. I wasn't connected in the contemporary studio glass world at that time. So, uh, but my brother, John, who I hadn't seen in two or three years, lived in Dearborn, Michigan. So I said, well, if I accept this invitation to have a sh to be part of an exhibition, paperweight exhibition at Habitat, I can visit my brother. So what happened was I met a lot of wonderful people who were curious about my process. And that made me feel pretty proud, you know. And so I, uh, I did very well. First sold, uh, the Habitat Gallery sold the five paperweights that I was exhibiting. And he asked me to have a, a show uh, the following year. And uh, I accepted and he did well. And another nice thing, Doug Heller from Heller Gallery in New York uh, invited me to have a show. And he must have found out that Fur did pretty good with my work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it all, you know, so, so I had a show. But I connected, I mean, I emotionally connected with the studio glass and I was a bit of a, uh, outlier because my process was flame working and there wasn't a lot of information about that at the time. Paul, what year was that show when you had it at the gallery? You maybe I believe it was 77. I had forgotten, but uh, I believe it was 1977. It was We got some nods from Ferd. <laughs> and you know, uh, that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful show. I think Paul Hollister, the, uh, the New York, uh, uh, Glass Critic showed up. He wrote about it in the New York Times and in uh, Collector Magazine. And it was very, very festive. And I enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed, I met uh, uh, Richard Ritter. Uh, I think Paisa was there. I mean, it was really very, very well attended. Okay, next. So flame working is I take advantage of gas oxygen with a bench burner. And I used uh, colored, soda lime colored glasses and uh, sculpt out my flowers and fruit and insects and this and that. And next. And then build my uh, design 
on a hot plate. Now there's a Bunsen burner under that plate, keeping the, keeping the, the glass hot. And with my hand torch and simple tools, I can build, build my design. Next. That's amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron is phenomenal. Aaron <laughs> is uh, one of the most enthusiastic people I know. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> With a cowboy greeting. <laughs> That's right. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, <laughs> this is a process that I worked out. Uh, I'm heating up clear glass. I have a collar and a plate, and I have my colored glass uh, design on the bottom of that uh, plate, on the plate, and, the, and I drop the hot glass onto the colored glass flower. Now I have a suction pump underneath underneath the, um, the oven, Pastorelli I call it, and I suck the glass onto the colored glass, and it gives me uh, a wonderful dimension and and it just works. So next. Got a question for you. Do you use a uh, magnification when you're making the flowers and bees? Mm, I have reading glass magnification. That's about it. That was wild. But yes. what I love now with the orbs, these, uh, I, I went from paperweights. I'll show you a little later on in the, in the, in the slideshow, but I went from paperweights to uh, blocks. And now the, the orbs, the spherical forms. I love the magnification of the spherical forms. It's really been, a, uh, it's really fascinated me to see my work 360 and then extend and then to encapsulate them in a cube and, and be able to uh, have an intelligence, have a visual intelligence on all six sides. It's almost so I use like, this is a gas oxygen flame that I'm building the uh, the, the sphere, and then next you'll see me. Uh, this is this is attached. To, um, it's attached to a a, a, a puntal pipe, and then next I knock it off in the oven and keep it, I anneal it for 40 hours. And, uh, but I love, I love, well, I'm, I'm at a wonderful place. Uh, I've been, I've been doing this for so long. That I feel, I feel blessed that I can still discover new things. The glass is teaching me how to be creative. Hmm. It's fascinating, you know? And uh, with my new schedule, I have a very, very <clears throat> rigid schedule of Coming in a little later, having a nap after lunch, and leaving a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So after the uh, this is uh, grinding and polishing, the uh, the orbs I, I title them orbs, spherical forms. We have three uh, cups that are on three uh, in, individual motors. And the cups have diamond and they're diamond, um, they're diamond impregnated tips, and they grind the glass in a spherical form. Next, uh, you know, I, I've really, I, I've, being associated with the studio glass moment has been a blessing. Uh, I met uh, uh, Ed Hopper. I've been, I'm close to Wheat Knots in Millville, New Jersey, and we have the, uh, Wheat Knots has the internet, uh, the uh, Creative Glass Center of America. And Ed Hopper came to, uh, for an artist in residence fellowship, they call them. And he started playing with um, enamels and uh, high firing enamel. And he, uh, and he introduced me to this, uh, what he called he started marketing on Paradise Paints. So I started to um, take a press out clear glass in a leaf shape and then paint it with enamels and put veining on it. And and uh, mm. felt very fortunate that I have that invented that illusion. And there's an ant. Uh, what, uh, 
I forget, Joe and Anna from Montreal. What's their last name? Mandel. Mandel. So I was at Silver. Habitat Code was representing me at Silver, and I had this work. And Anna came over, and I said, oh, Anna, this is new. Look at the ant. She goes, I don't like the ant. I thought you were going to drop it. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm glad you didn't drop it. But I was surprised. I thought, well, it's only got glass. It's only a bunch of little, little glass. <laughs> but she didn't. She, she related to it as an ant. Too realistic. Next. That's awesome. And this is, uh, winter, I call them winter gourds. I don't know. I, I, I worked on this. Um, you know, I'm, it's very, it's very uh, esoteric in a way. I'm into how, a negative space. And here's an example of a shell, gourds, I call them gourds. And I thought, well, I don't know what to call them. I think I'll call them winter gourds. <laughs> and so I put, I, put, uh, I put dots on the clear glass and I rolled it in powder and then I cased it with uh, yellow, yellow green glass and then cut it in half, polished it and Here's a uh, gourd. And then my, uh, with the damsel fly, um, it all worked. Next. This was a major breakthrough. This was in 1980. I, I wanted from paperweights. Believe it or not, I went in the studio one day and I thought, damn, why didn't I, why couldn't I have invented a paperweight? Here I'm dedicating my, my, all my energy and intellect to making paperweights, and they were made 100 years ago. So I started experimenting and came up with uh, a way to stack uh, two halves together and, and present uh, a flowering plant. And that was a major breakthrough because all of a sudden, I really had an opportunity to uh, offer more visual information about what I'm interested in. And I, and it slowly became uh, from doing the botanical top and bottom, when I went back to paperweights, I started putting imagery under the paperweight. So I had the top view and then the, the bottom view. But the root, my figures started to uh, integrate into the, uh, into the root system. Next. This is under, this is a, was in a botanical and it was on the underside. And uh, I kind of like, he looks a little melancholy or something. There's something there. <laughs> and, and, and what's interesting about it is, at times, when I'm encapsulating colored glass, I'm trying to keep every, uh, spontaneity is very important to me, but at times, the molten glass pushes the colors around and I get beautiful effects, illusions. Next. Here's the gang, here's the gang. This is a, a cluster of uh, human forms. And I'm accused of, uh, what am I accused of? I'm accused of a lot of things, <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> A little erotic. There are times when I'll, I won't admit to doing erotica. I'll say that the spontaneity of the colored glass, spontaneity of the clear glass makes things happen. <laughs> Next. This is, um, uh, this is uh, a botanical, and the botanical evolved where I started to cut and polish and laminate clear glass, colored glass on the clear glass. And what was so exciting about it is all of a sudden when I would back the, the, the rectangular blocks with dark glass, I ended up with space. It lost its glass quality and became negative space. So I have a, a cluster of daisies and human forms with a damsel fly and then a golden orb floating above with a daisy, uh, with a daisy in. Next. This is uh, Mount Laurel. Do you have Mount Laurel in Michigan? Mm, I don't think so, no. 
Not that I'm aware of. Well, mound walls are considered uh, by many of the botanists to be uh, one of the most uh, attractive uh, flowering bushes in America. But uh, mountain laurel took me about five years to develop, and I didn't do it continual. I would just play around, experiment, and nothing, experiment a little bit more, get a little bit more familiar out, familiar with the illusion. And it took me about after five years, bingo. I had a show at Habitat, uh, Habitat Gallery in Florida, and I came back. It was reasonably successful, and I, well, it was successful. I came back home. I was whipped, and uh, I said, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go back to making things. I'm gonna try to perfect the mountain wall blossom." And uh, <clears throat> I worked on it for about 30 days, and it was getting tense, and I was running out of money. And believe it or not, I I went to bed uh, with the idea that uh, I just went to bed, and all of a sudden I had an idea how to do the mountain wall blossom, and I fell asleep. And I woke up the next morning, went into the studio, bingo, I hit a home run. And I, it doesn't happen too often. As a matter of fact, very rare, rarely does that happen. Paul, what's that, what's that flower called again? Mountain laurel. Mountain laurel, got it. Yeah. Um, I got a question about the uh, previous work. What is the significance of the golden sphere? I like the idea of, uh, well, gold um, suggests to me, I like to set Put the gold, the flower, and the golden uh, sphere, suggesting uh, the, the spiritual. But but another thing, I like working with gold leaf. <laughs> it's almost inert, and uh, there's something very ambiguous about it. So what's the, the? I don't know. Maybe somebody could could think of a better. Uh, rationale for the golden uh, sphere floating above the flowers, but to me it's just a design element. Next, next, okay. This is a cube. Uh, so from paperweights, from making the human forms, I started to get tired of making the human forms. I started to play around with masks. Next, and this is. Uh, masks that uh, actually my daughter did a lot of the uh, a lot of the work on the masks so sculpting the masks encasing them and casting them in uh, clear glass and then painting them with paradise paints painting them white and that was very interesting it was a nice friend you know they weren't very successful in the marketplace and now they are because Everybody's want, everybody wants a mask, but I'm not, you know, I'm just moving forward. I'm not moving backwards. But interestingly enough, <clears throat> keep, keep, keep going. This was, I think Habitat sold this years ago. I think this was made in the mid-90s. I'd love to know who owns it. Thank God uh, Scheibel did the photography. And thank God I had it photographed. But, I look at that. I didn't think at the time, you know, you, you don't have a, I looked at my work and I know oh, that's nice. I'm proud of that and send it into the market. And then five years later, you go back to some of these designs and think, hey, this is special. Well, this is one of my special pieces that I don't know where it is. So anyway, next. This is a nice story, a sad story in a way. Um, 9-11 was, uh, about two months after 9-11, Hella Gallery had a, had an exhibition focused on 9-11, hottest response to the 9-11 tragedy. So I thought, you know, what am I going to do? I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do flowers. So I encapsulated mask, there's masks behind this. I encapsulated uh, the cast glass mask with the, um, put a little red, red uh, uh, enamel on the eye and um, built this six inch orb by sections. Then I thought, well, I need a base for it. 
and I had a wooden base and it didn't do it. So I went out and I got a, I got a small flag and I scuffed it up on cement, folded it up and put it, put it over the, the wooden base and had it in the shelf. And um, didn't sell, which was okay. So I had it in my home and a collector's group came to the house and uh, Bruce Bachman saw it and said, oh yeah, I'd like to own that. I'd like to that for sale. I said, sure. I don't have any money. Typical, typical artist response. Sure. I, <laughs> he always did. So anyway, he bought it. And he was he and he really it he it touched him. So uh, uh bless him, he died and left his collection to the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. And um, I, the, the curator of that, that museum came to visit me and talked about this, uh, I, I don't even, I forget the, what I titled it, but 9-11. And he said, he's going to separate this from my work and put it in a sculptural gallery. I thought, oh, that's nice. So that's the story. Next. I'll add a little bit to this one, Paul. I went to the Henry Ford, and this is the first time I ever saw you make masks, in my personal experience. And I saw the Henry Ford and immediately took a picture of it and sent it to you and told you how uh, impressed I was and uh, amazed at your talent and being able to cover such a topic like this in your own style. And yeah. it, it moved me personally. And Thank I you. fell in love with the piece, and I'm glad it's in public display at the Henry Ford. Yeah. And this is a nice piece. This is a commissioned by uh, Robin Minkoff. And uh, it's an assemblage. I, I think of them as assemblages. And I would encapsulate my glass flowers in blocks. And, and then the, the golden orb is encapsulated in a block. And then I would uh, send them out to be ground and polished and laminated together and then laminated a black sheet of black glass behind it. And actually in this piece, I think we laminated a, a three, quarters of a, three quarters of an inch or a half inch sheet of optical glass. And um, they're very, very, uh, I'm very proud of the work. A lot of very labor intense. But, um, and here's the little, his bugs, his honeybees, and here's the uh, lady slipper, no, not lady slipper, ladybug and uh, lilacs, mountain roll, um, mountain roll, uh, morning glory, and uh, roses. Next. I got a question for you, and you may have covered this, but maybe we can get it in more detail. How do you hold the interior glass objects together so that the hot glass you pour over them doesn't move them off center? Well, it's because I've been doing it for uh, a lot of years and I've learned how to uh, sculpt. I learned how to protect the detail of my colored glass, my flower, which is colored glass, protect the detail with clear glass. Mm. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, it's all an illusion. Well, it's an illusion, but it is an illusion. It's, it's working with clear glass, working with negative space to suggest, um, uh, dimension. And, uh, for whatever the reason, I've been obsessed by this, this, I have been obsessed by my my career in a way, making work, and uh, you know, I I would make work when well, I didn't have any money to make work. Pat <laughs> <laughs> Pat told me my wife Pat bless her heart, she came in and she said, you know, Paul, you need a hobby. <laughs> All you do is talk about glass. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so this is an eight-inch, eight-inch orb, 
that has, I don't know, 20 or 30 bees in it, all buzzing around the, 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 the honeycomb. And um, it's a lot of work. Next. Same eight inch orb with flowers, floating, floating bouquets. You know, one of my secrets is that uh, I'm willing to spend three or four hours on one honeybee. If I just, it's, I have to get it right. People, you know, and I look at others and they say, oh, you must have a real, real neat trick here. I go, yeah, just a lot of labor. <laughs> right. Next. Patience is your trick. Patience and neighbor. And this is a cube. And lately I've been a colorist. I've enjoyed uh, colors. And that's been a fascinating uh, world. Um, the flowers are very complex. They're referential. I, I, um, uh, this is a tribute to Emily Dickinson. I have a poet series and I've, I've, uh, I love the transcendental the transcendental attitudes that Walt Whitman's poetry celebrates. Emily Dickinson's attitudes are a little, a little bit more, uh, less transcendental. But Emily Dickinson's poetry is at times very abstract, where Whitman is in your face. Hmm. Next. I got a question about the bees. It might be a, a, a secret, but they, a question. Oh, I hope it is. Right. Uh, I'll tell that secret. <laughs> when you. Uh, oh, the, uh, Aaron, my secret is I don't have any secrets. Right. It's a great, great way to think about it. But a great way to plan for the future with those who've studied under you. Um, in this piece, the bees are separated from the flowers. How do you suspend them? Is it magic? Well, that's a good question. Uh, that's a big secret. But what I'll tell you is I, I have the bees on my plate preheated. I cast, I drop the glass onto the honeybees. I add, I add uh, the underside to protect, to encase the full bee. Then I, I recast it in a mold to get the section I need to put six sections together. So it's, um, no, it's. Uh, I'm guessing it's assembled in a way. It's it's a set, yeah, this is assembled. It's blown out, it went right over my head, but I caught that part of it, so. I well, appreciate. you know, I do it in sections. Right. Six sections, uh, I have them, uh, I call, <laughs> you invent your own vocabulary to explain it. I have, I have uh, caps and uh, hemispheres. Okay. You, you covered it a bit earlier about the top and the bottom of the work you created. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked to just help uh, understand the top and the bottom. If we can see a line, for lack of a better word, within the top and bottom of clear glass piece. Well, I have an index refraction line that you can, if you look closely, you can see that there are two sections that were sealed together. And, um, you know, it's uh, part of the process. It's the process, um, and but I can I can hide it a little bit. This is a new piece. It's a, uh, what's interesting is the flowers and uh, the fruit, the uh, the pistil and stamens on the on the uh, flowers are pretty pretty interesting. Pretty hard to do actually. This kind of work where the uh, center part. In the, or for the lack of a better term, your core gets mm -hmm. closer and closer to the edge. Is there a limit where you start to get nervous when it starts to get too big? Well, you know, I don't want to distort, you know, I mean, I'm very, I'm very, very uh, protective of the integrity of the design. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, it's so important to, um, to get it right, I call it getting it right. You know, and what does that mean? Well, I don't know. I know what it means to me, but <laughs> you know, it's a look. I'm trying to get something that that feels right. And then the honeybees pollinating the blossoms. So it's really, a, and then the, the fruit, and then under the underneath, there are more uh, earth earth shades. Next. So this is um, this is a. Um, the underside of the of that orb, 
and you have in your collection, I mean, I'll tell you, uh, because you're one of the leading galleries in the world for, for glass eyes, and, and, and you have wonderful, Habitat Gallery has wonderful connoisseurship. They, they show the best work and they're not, you know, and so I'm, I'm keen on sending, uh, I'm trying to impress Ferg and Kathy. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to make Ferg wet his pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ferg and I go back quite a ways. <laughs> and uh, I asked, uh, this is kind of a funny, it's kind of a nice story. Here I am, 77. God will, and I can go for another 10 or 15 years. And I, you know, I, 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 I'm so proud of the work I'm doing. And I'm taking my time. I'm doing. I don't have assistants. I have assistants helping me put it together. But I'm enjoying making all the little components. There's nothing boring about my work. I can come into the studio and spend three hours making a little, making leaves, <laughs> or rootlets, and think, oh boy, what a day. <laughs> But I'm not trying to, you know. So I asked Lawrence Stumps. Lawrence Stumps is a master uh, in uh, flame working master who does uh, portrait canes. And I said, Lauren, would you make me a, a signature cane? It's called a signature cane. Paul Stankett cursive. And he said, sure. I said, oh, yeah, nice. So he made a cursive cane, and it's right in the middle. It's Paul Stankett and uh, with, I signed, I wrote my name about five times and he used that as a guide to uh, make my cursive signature cane, which is interesting. Next. Oh, this is a cute story. I, you know, I've, hey, I've been so fortunate. I've lectured all over the world. I've taught workshops around the world. Penland, Pilchuk, Scotland, Japan, and uh, and sometimes I get people so eager to eager to learn my process, and they watch me make a paperweight or make a, a cube with flowers, and they're so eager to start, and <clears throat> it doesn't work. <laughs> they, don't have, they don't have the experience. It's a you know you have to. Get, you have to dedicate your time and energy to a process to master it. But I was invited to speak at the Renwick Gallery, and I was so um, happy to be there. And I was fascinated by that room. It had uh, images of uh, paintings. I think there were paintings or portraits. I don't know. I can't remember if there's photographs or paintings. But they were all Native American the tribes and uh, I asked the photographer who was photographing me, I said, could you get me from the back so I can have a picture of the, of the room? And she said, sure. And she told me after that, they saw, the, Renwick saw that and said, boy, we should do more photographing the speaker from, from the back. Right, behind. Yeah, next. Aha, I wrote a book. No Green Berries or Leaves, The Creative Journey of an Artist in Glass. And um, that was the title of my, one of my poems uh, ded dedicated to my mom. Um, I'm not going to tell you the punchline because it's in the book. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good, it makes sense when you think about it. I mean, but uh, the book is uh, inside a window into studio glass from an outlier's perspective, from a flame worker. Studio glass was really dominated by molten blowing, glass blowing. And then it died uh, further, one of the few galleries that opened it up to other processes, which is interesting. And uh, because it was primarily glass blowing. And then um, I, well, I don't know where I'm going with that, other than if you want a good book about <laughs> studio glass from a flame worker's perspective. You're saying buy my book. Got it, Paul. <laughs> you can get it on Amazon.com. I think it's pretty good value. I think they're down to like 20 bucks or something. <laughs> then buy it, read it, and share it, right, Paul? That's great. There you go. 
and then spark to create a flame. I identify 12, 12 artists who take advantage of the flame working process and uh, wrote a book on flame working. That's uh, Ginny Ruffner's uh, sculpture at the bottom and my daughter, Chris, and my assistant, Dave Graver. Chris, uh, Chris was making bees and damselflies and she's very talented, but she, she went on when I was slowing down, she went on to, now she's a teacher. Next. This was a nice book, Studio Crafters Career Guide to Achieving Excellence in Outmaking. You know, it really is about excellence and it's about making it personal. I tell my students, you know, if you make it personal, um, you'll invent your own vocabulary to express the things you care about. Okay, next. And here's a shot I'm demonstrating at Salem Community College. We have a very successful program, although COVID, COVID knocked the wind out of it. I mean, uh, they have a, I don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, they really, uh, they opened up a couple of classes. I think they got about 10 or 15 kids uh, have to wear a face masks and this and that and other. And they're not doing, they're doing flame working under the hoods. But uh, we have an international frameworking conference, which is the next program. Next, here's uh, one of my class, one of my demos. And uh, these young people are so eager and to learn the craft. And this is response, and this this interest by the young people are responsible for a tremendous amount of growth. Now there's a secret in the flame working world. It used to be a secret. I don't know if it's still a secret. A lot of the young people are doing doing very well making these water pipes, pot pipes. And uh, Salem Community College has a scientific class program. Two years making laboratory apparatus, glass apparatus. After two years, you're not allowed to make a pot pipe at uh, Salem, but two years of making complex instruments, you can knock out a pot pipe in a, with your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they crank it out after two years and some of them, not all. Next. Well, this is an interesting story. God bless my wife. She said, you know, Paul, you've got to clean your studio. Whatever happens, what if something happens to you, what am I going to do? you have to clean your studio. So about two or three years of telling me how to clean my studio, I went into the crawl space and the boxes and I, un I took out the experiments, some failures, um, just, uh, well, they're primarily experiments, failures, and Why not? another category. There's another category, just I didn't like it. So I, the reason I saved it, and I saved them for years, I was going to cast them all in a big sculpture. This was going to be my grand finale. And I realized that, you know, I, you know, you get into this, sometimes, you know, you don't, I didn't want to dedicate my life to try to figure out the technical, solve the technical problems of casting all this glass into a form, I was gonna make a human form. So I decided I'm gonna destroy them. So I put them in my oven and I ran the oven up to a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, next. And then I uh, shoveled them into a bucket, a barrel of water. And I destroyed, I don't know, I'm almost self-conscious to tell you how much I destroyed. I destroyed about 500 pieces maybe a little bit more. I'm still destroying my work. Not, not you know, one or two here and there. I don't want to, it's about protecting the integrity of my work. It's about protecting my, my legacy in a way. So um, people would come in like, Pat, even Pat said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm getting rid of the, the failures. Why? Because I don't want them on the market. And Robert Minkoff, uh, a dear friend who passed away just recently, he would say, what are you doing for God's sakes? Let me have some of them. No. <laughs> Even the UPS guy was trying to get 
<laughs> Everybody that had any contact with me, they were freaking out. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that. I'll see yeah. anything wrong with that. <laughs> Let me have it. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, it's just, it's just what you want to be known for. Mm-hmm. Next. Oh, this is cute. A friend of mine's daughter went to art school and she was studying photography and she said, uh, you think Paul Stanker would let me do some photography for him? I said, sure. So uh, my friend said, do you think you'd let my daughter do some photography for you? I said, absolutely. So she came to the studio, spent four or five hours just being there. And the next, she said, I'm going to come back in the, in, the, in the end of the week. Do you have a suit? I said, yeah, I have a suit. <laughs> I said, okay, I want you to wear a suit. And uh, I'll bring some flowers and we'll see what we can do. So I have a little mud hole in the corner of my property. She said, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> so so I, I went, she said, I want you to sprinkle flowers in the, on the water in the mud hole. So I want you to stand in the middle. So I'm standing in the water and, had, and after when I went in there with my suit and all, that went freaking nuts. I said, you ruined the suit. I didn't <laughs> ruin the suit. I can get it dry cleaned. Go on your shoes. I said, I wasn't wearing shoes. I had slippers on. That's funny. It's <laughs> a great she shot. Run a, she runs a tough ship, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so here we are. You know, I... I and no, no, this is a, I'm very sympathetic. I'm very, very sympathetic to, well, I'm very, I care about the young students and the young artists. And so this is an, Amanda, she graduated from art school and she did photography. I said, well, you wanna come and take some pictures? So I looked at that and I said, two chipmunks. <laughs> <laughs> we've listened, <laughs> we've been married for 57 years and we're starting to look alike. <laughs> It's cute. Next. Oh, this is the Lawrence Stumps portrait king. This is, uh, excuse me, this is his signature king, cursive. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's awesome. To get that line in the cross to S and the T, he cut it down and then he added that section and sealed it together. Hmm. It's really quite, quite interesting. Next. Oh, we're coming down, we're coming down the wire here. I wrote this poem for the future. Receive this glass, it holds my memories. Crafted blossoms suspended in stillness to be pollinated by your sight, anticipating your touch through time. Ta-da, (laughs) ta-da. This is one of my favorites. Actually, I I just recently wrote a poem and uh, prior to that, this was one of the last poems. Next. So I'm going to skip ahead a little oh. bit. And uh, I wanna, before we show the video, I wanted to show uh, the uh, some pieces that add a little bit of uh, your talent. Show your talent, everybody. The pieces that are uh, from your collection and from secondary market. And just an idea of the talent of Paul Stanker. This is a newer work that Paul sent us at the gallery. Um, another stunning cube. See if I get my computer to continue going forward. This is what you said was an assembled piece. I think this is the one behind me. Assemblage, yeah, with uh, different different insects and different insects pieces. and pieces. Wow. Just just it's great to see these works come back into the world, especially after you're letting them go. Is this um, the Belkin collection? It, this piece is Belkin, yeah. Oh, I had a question. Mike was a beautiful, beautiful person. Recently passed away and. Uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed our friendship and I got a, with his wife and him. Yeah, Annie, you're great. Um, do you, uh, when you're in the creative process and you're making, do you have an idea or a drawing of the design you're going to be making or just work impulsively? Well, I, uh, I sketch it out, but my sketches are like hand scratching. They're not, uh, they're not works of art. They're just leading to uh, finishing work. This was a beautiful piece. I remember this one. Yeah, it's my beautiful use of colors. That's beautiful. Yeah. Photography is pretty good on it. Yeah. And then another question for you. Um, 
is there a special kind of glass that is used in the flame working as opposed to the glass used uh, for blowing glass objects? Uh, my clear glass is optical quality. Um, shot in Derrier, Pennsylvania, produced uh, uh, a, uh, clear glass that, uh, that I take advantage of. This is a fascinating piece. This is uh, the masks in the bottom, and the, the berries and flowers and golden oil floating above. Yeah, a little bit of everything in that one. It's yeah, this is uh, they're encyclopedic. Yeah. And these are in immaculate condition from when you originally made them to yep. share this story with the, the Belkins now back on the market for future wow. sale. Well, I know that the, the work had, uh, uh, Mike and Annie were very generous lending their work to museums for retrospective exhibitions, which is very, very nice. But uh, I'll continue yeah. on, we'll get through these. Just different colors you've used in the background, reds and blues. Yeah instead of just blacks beautiful few it's amazing your, your talent of i can't imagine making things so small every day and you do it every day all the time that's why i'm half nuts <laughs> it's spectacular <laughs> okay another orb i got a question for you so the colored glass can be used in flame working and in blowing yes but i don't do blowing i just uh, right just, just the style, the type of glasses you Cast to. it and work it. You know, oh, this is a nice one. I forgot about this one. This is a cloistered botanical where I had uh, the green glass. It's actually very dark, dense green, and it's used for uh, welding lenses. And this yeah. is a number seven welding glass. But it comes quite, when I work it into a, I laminate it onto the sides of a clear glass rectangle, it, it comes, comes across as black. You put it under light and you can see a little green. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Belkins were uh, uh, friends of yours and- Very, uh, Mike, uh, so sweet. Mike and I, Mike actually uh, was an antique French paperweight collector. And he saw, he bid on one of my pieces at an antique French paperweight auction in New York City, I think it was Christie's. And uh, he said, uh, I wonder if I can, he talked to his a person who was uh, helping him and said, I wonder if we can uh, get more of these, this type of work. So she gave, gave Mike, this is a nice piece, gave Mike my name and Mike uh, became a patron of my work. And a big collector, he had a, uh, a, a substantial collection Yes, he did. Duty, he donated. Duty. Actually, he, he and Annie donated a, a major collection to the Akronaut Museum, among other places. Yep. So it's uh, that's a that's a queen bee on that cone. This is a beautiful piece. And I separate the uh, the different layers by uh, with a veil. Ha! Uh, we can uh, we can thank Regina at Habitat for shooting some video while we talk here, but yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Belkin, Michael and Annie Belkin had an impressive collection and a variety of work from, I guess, the start of your career to later on when they started. Stopped well, collecting. what was so uh, sweet, um, as Mike uh, became more interested in uh, having a retrospective collection, he would, he purchased pieces on the market. I know he purchased a very, very miniature piece uh, uh, that was available uh, through a dealer, and uh, I was I was impressed. Yeah, you always were in contact with him. He was a great friend. Yeah, yeah, he was active with the Creative Glass Center of America. He was active with the uh, Alliance for Contemporary Glass. So you know, it's really been uh, people like uh, Balkan and uh, Doug Andrews, Doug Andrews, and Doug Anderson. Excuse me. And others, Joe and uh, Annie Mundell. So talking about your collections, there are some museums that have bodies of your work. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? I know about a few of them myself, like the Imagine Museum has a substantial collection. Can yeah, we they have a beautiful collection of about 100 pieces. The Chicago Art Institute has a major collection of my work, highlighted by, by its own pedestal, a swarm, a honeybee swarm. 
You see the succulent pistil in the flower there. It's very, very, you know, I'm very proud of that. And then the, uh, the bulbs. I'm very, very into bulbs. I thought I saw some. Why? Must be something in my childhood. <laughs> I you remember know, pulling up beets and carrots and things. Oh, look at that! Pulled out of the ground. Wow! Look at that. <laughs> so that translated to this whole under under the earth uh, <laughs> under the earth investigation. The uh, the Corning Museum of Art has a paperweight collection that's pretty impressive. I remember walking through there. Yeah. And seeing your works along with yeah, others. My work, yeah. And then yeah. separate interestingly enough, they separated the botanicals. They put the botanicals in the contemporary glass collection and the paper and the few of my paperweights in the paperweight collection. Right. So it doesn't matter to me, but uh, that's so interesting. Aaron, oh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to jump on and say hi to Paul. Sure. And uh, just uh, it's a nice memory going back. Um, Paul's 20-year retrospective was my first foray, foray into getting into glass as a young curator and one of my first exhibitions that I had to put together and know about paperweights and it was daunting at the time but um, a great journey so so wonderful to um, be able to work with you Paul at the very Thank beginning you. and it closed uh, my chapter as a uh, at the Bergstrom with um, a, a gift from the staff of one of your early spring beauties. And oh, nice. yeah. it was wonderful. And, and little did they know that that's how I started. So. Jan <laughs> Smith, I don't see if it, is this you again? Uh, Who's she, parking? Jan Smith from. Jan oh, Smith. wonderful Jan, congratulations. You're too young to have been, re to decide to retire, but <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> You know, you had a beautiful career. Jan has uh, had promoted excellence in the paperweight aesthetic by writing, critiquing, and uh, encouraging uh, people to push a little harder. Wow. Thank you, Jan. I get congratulations on your, uh, your release and uh, look forward to seeing what you're doing next. And, oh, thanks, uh, Aaron. And thank you for, for putting this together. And um, Gee, if you want to learn paperboy making, I can, uh, <laughs> I can give you lessons. There you go. I'm, I'm up like, for it. A, a whole new career. I <laughs> can't wait. Right. Well, I wanted to uh, thank everybody for being here. If anybody has any more questions, this would be the time. Um, honored to have you here, Paul. This was very fun, very eye opening and enlightening. Wow. Thank you. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a talent you are. And I'll just let this video play out. Uh, just showing details of the works that we have at the galleries. And, uh, you know, Paul, again, thank you for being our living legend presenter here at the Habitat Now. Can I raise my prices if I'm a legend? Absolutely, Paul. That's the thing. <laughs> that's the whole thing. Get those prices up. Bye bye now. <laughs> Surprise, they're not a million dollars a piece. <laughs> it should be. You know, it's really been a beautiful journey. I've, uh, I have all these memories of uh, being involved in the, with other artists and teaching and meeting so many young young people interested in being involved. And and there's so much talent out there. So, yeah, Aaron, definitely. you're 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 really a, a treasure. How <laughs> can I gather you and Corey and the younger people, uh, Kathy and Ferd, uh, did a beautiful job, and now they can rest. That's for sure. Paul, we're, we're, uh, I know you're working on some new things. I'm looking forward to seeing what you create next. And the works that we have are on display right now. If everybody wants to come by or ask me any questions, if our works are available for purchase, it's um, he's definitely an important part of any glass collection. And I love exploring museums and just coming across your work. Walked into Flint, there's your pieces. I walked into Henry Ford, was moved by the, by the piece that I saw about 9-11. Um, it's, it's the um, the Berkson um, Model Museum has a beautiful collection of my work. That's great. And uh, you know, it's funny how things come together. Uh, the Berkson Model Museum had a seminar on contemporary glass in 76 or 77. I was in, and I met Javi Littleton and Dominic Lupino and I met, I think I met, um, 
Oh, now that I'm other artists. And then for uh, the Habitat Gallery inviting me to be in uh, an exhibition. It's amazing how it all came together and, uh, and was a wonderful learning experience. For me. The, paint, the, the, uh, the studio glass artists appeared to be having more fun than the paperweight collectors. That's a whole different conversation. I bumped into the paperweight collecting community. It's a whole different group of people. It's a different attitude, different aesthetic, different expectations. Yeah, it's totally different. It's totally something I need to learn about. Well, thank you again, Paul. This was great. And thank you for everybody for joining us today. And uh, it was an honor to have you all and enjoy your weekend. And feel Thanks. free to contact me anytime. Unmute yourself, say goodbye, say hi. Bye-bye. Oh, hi, that was excellent. I had so much fun listening to you. <laughs> oh, Mary! How are you, Mary? Good, good. I expect you to. Well, you're, well, you're, you're, you're looking good, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So are you. <laughs> um, I expected you to read your recent poem to us. Uh, you know what? I want, you know, can I do that? Do you have time here? Uh, anybody wants to hang out. We're not going anywhere. Okay, well, let me do this, because this is interesting. Yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, have my uh, text-to-speech. Oh, I don't know. Did I just kill it? Nope, oh, you're still there. I still see you. Right. Well, I'll have to read it, but I'd rather have text-to-speech read it, but let me, uh, let me read the poem. Actually, hold on now. Oh, okay. I've, I've been obsessing over this. How do I get back on the visual? We can see you. Okay. So well, either way, we can see you. Okay. I titled it uh, Mystical Illusion. In, the, in early morning darkness, lighting the studio brings quiet time for prayer and preparation. At the workbench, sculpted molten glass flowers become a metaphysical celebration beyond nature. When the hour of skilled work is when the hours of skilled work is completed, the hut ball deepens a creative joy while carrying the glowing glass to the oven with a spiritual bliss. The oven is open in in preparation for a metallic tap, freeing the object off the pipe as it drops into the ceramic fiber nest. Ceramic fiber nest. A 40 hour molecular transformation begins its inorganic existence annealed. The orb offers an ethereal halo as a mystical illusion. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, did I give you the quote on uh, Walt Whitman? The narrowest hinge of my hand puts the score on all machines. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. The narrowest hinge of my hand puts the score on all machinery as a maker. I almost creep. Now that I'm only 77, this is, this is what Whitman has to say about death. So I hope you right. Yes. I'm fortunate enough to have one of your poems that fell with one of my early pieces of yours that you made that root people also have words on them. Yeah, word yeah. came. That was the influence of poetry trying to get into my glass. And I have the poem that you wrote to go with that piece. Oh, nice. It's and I will show that nothing can happen more beautiful than death. That's Walt Whitman's song of myself. <laughs> and to die. I don't know. I don't know if he's up for discussion. I don't know. I want that. Yeah, it's a whole yeah. different day, Paul. <laughs> and to die is different from what anyone supposes and luckier. Gotcha. That's strange, isn't it? Yep, yeah, it is strange. Well, on that note, Paul, thank you again for joining okay. us today. Take well, care, got... everybody, and have a great weekend. Nice to see you, Ferd and Kathy, too. Thank yes. you. Bye. Bye. Good seeing you, Mary. Oh, that was great. And bye, Idris. Bye, Bob. Bye, are, you, Bye, are you going to hang out after this is over, after your recording? <laughs> I'm going to go take a nap. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Be well. Bye. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye.